Sacred Symbols, a PlayStation podcast, is brought to you by, well, you. If you want to learn how to support our show, go to patreon.com slash laststandmedia. Greetings and salutations. Welcome back to Sacred Symbols Plus, a PlayStation podcast supplement. My name is Colin Moriarty. Today I'm joined by a very special guest indeed, someone I'm very pleased to have on the show. He's Sandeep Rai, uh, joining me from Europe, uh, right? Uh, yeah, London, it's, UK. And it's, I was going to say, uh, it's pretty late there. So I appreciate you taking the time to do this uh, late, at your, late for you. Uh, I know it's not the most convenient, so I appreciate that. No, no problem. It's uh, it's easier when the kids are in bed, so, so I'd prefer doing it now. Oh, that's perfect. Earlier. Perfect. <laughs> um, well, I'm very happy to have you on the show. Uh, it's very nice to meet you. I think some of our audience know who you are already here on Sacred Symbols because you are one of the great champions of PlayStation Vita, uh, and you know how we feel about Vita here on Sacred Symbols, and you have a new project on Kickstarter that I want to talk about, but before any of that, Let's just acquaint you with the uh, with the audience. Who are you? Um, tell us about yourself and how you found your way to this hobby, and and ultimately found your way to Vita. Sure. Um, so yeah, like I said, Sandy Pry. Um, <clears throat> I've been I've been a gamer forever. So it's actually funny. Today is the fortieth uh, birthday of the BBC Micro, um, and so that was the first system I was gaming on, literally at the age of three. I remember my dad brought it home. It's it's one of those kind of early memories from you know from childhood. I remember my dad bringing it home. I remember games like Centipede, Asteroids, all those really old school games. And so ever since then, I've just been a major fan of gaming, and just it's been like you know my primary hobby. Um, and I think it's kind of as as I got older, you know, I was traveling a lot with work, and I found that I wasn't really playing my consoles much anymore. I was really pay, playing portable gaming systems, and so the PSP became just like my system it's it's the the main console that i would be playing on i'd be on my psp all the time taking it with me wherever i went you know i took it on honeymoon with me introduced my wife to patapon you know i remember Aww. like uh when my son was born i mastered the art of holding the bottle kind of in my elbow while like playing uh, kingdom hearts so yeah. it's uh, it's it was with me like the you know the whole the whole way through those whole all those years of the psp was there um, and so then when the Vita came out, it's, you know, as soon as the announcement came, I had to buy it, you know, it's, it was a day one buy for me, you know, and I, I've loved it ever since. Um, and so I've, I've always just, you know, been a gamer, loved gaming. And it was really, I didn't start my YouTube channel until probably 20, I think it was 2013. So I remember I did a video, I got, I imported the PS TV from Japan when it first came out. And so it was the white model, which is quite hard to get these days. Um, and I did this kind of 10 minute unboxing and like, you know, video just kind of showing it. And I just did it kind of thought it'd be fun to do, put it out there. And, you know, I remember looking at it a couple of weeks later, it had no views at all. And I thought, ah, you know, doesn't matter. Came back a couple of months later and it had like 30,000 views. And I thought, oh, okay, this is, maybe this could be something. So, right. um, I, you know, I think it was a few months later, I started doing videos about the Vita and, just kind of found a bit of an audience that, you know, it's not just me and obviously you as well that love the Vita. There are a lot of us out there. And so it's just been great kind of just talking about it and being able to kind of review and highlight some of the games I love. It's awesome. I First of all, I love that you really helped tackle what I identified when, during my time at IGN when Vita came out as this hole in coverage. It was hard to justify mm. the level of coverage that I directed towards Vita at IGN. I think they let me get away with that because I had a little bit of clout and I used it in weird ways, like running a PS Vita channel and maybe yeah. not demanding the necessary traffic. But it didn't mean that there weren't other people that should have been covering it. And I feel like there was a disservice done to it almost because there weren't enough people gleaning onto it quickly enough like you or like me. And I, I, I hear these lamentations all the time, right? Oh my God, I just got my Vita. I'm like, yeah. dude, where were you? Like, <laughs> this is, I don't want to hear from you. You know, now it's too late. But, but uh, nonetheless, we, we persist and we're out here and I'm glad that you do this really awesome coverage and it's called Too Old for Gaming, right? Two, two yes. with a number and four with a number. Well, why do you say that? If you started it also back then, now, now I feel self-conscious about my age. <laughs> Why do you say too old for gaming? So it was funny. The the day I started my YouTube channel, um, 
I, I remember it really well. My my wife said to me kind of early on the day, aren't you too old to be playing games still? And then my mum said it to me later on today on that oh. day. And my mother-in-law said it to me, all of them oh. in the same day. And I just thought, that's it. That's that's the channel name. So I just went with it and, and that's just awesome. stuck ever since. I love that. Uh, so people <laughs> should go check that out. But the project I really wanted to focus on with you today, and I'm bringing it up here just so I can make sure I get the name right. You're doing this awesome hardback book called Vita Means Life. Of course, yes. one of the very first catch terms for our beloved handheld. And as of the time we're recording this, it still has about three weeks to go. But you've well surpassed many times over uh, the goal. The ask goal we have it here is just below eight thousand dollars is your ask in USD. And you're almost at thirty four thousand five hundred dollars. Um, yeah. And it's awesome. It's awesome to see, especially a broad base of more than 500 people supporting this book already. Um, but this isn't your first foray into writing something about Vita. And you've mm. put your money where your mouth is before. And you've done successful kickstarting before. And you are a talented writer and a, and a focused content creator. So tell me about your journey creating what I would say were a trio of books that actually led to this book. and what drew you to want to do that extra layer of work? Because, you know, we have things in our lives, real jobs, of course, for most people. I mean, I'm very lucky to be able to just play games at my leisure. Basically, most people have to carve out this time. So I really respect the grind here. So tell me a little bit about this authorship that you've undertaken with these books. Sure. So um, I'm trying to think what year it was. It's probably 2015, 2016, I think, when I first first sort of started this. Um, I, I love I love gaming history. I love kind of reading books about it. I love reading about the development of games. So I, I actually um, tried to develop some games myself for the iPhone um, years ago, like 20, 2011, 2010, um, which which completely panned. You know, they were they were they didn't do well at all. But you know, it was, it's it's something. It's I guess it was kind of a a dream to at least try. And I think I got it out of my system and realized that yeah, I'm no good at this. But I've always been fascinated by game design and the history of, of consoles and these companies. Um, and I really loved uh, Jeremy Parrish's books uh, on the Game Boy, Game Boy sure. World books. Um, you know, I love that kind of that history of the system, looking back at the games. And I think it was just kind of one day when I was reading them and I thought, you know, no one is ever going to do this for the Vita. No one's going to sit down and and kind of create these sort of this tombs just for the for the covering the life of the system and talking about these kind of games that I, I you know that I think have been brilliant for the for the Vita. So I thought, well, you know, I, I probably didn't have a huge audience at that time, but I thought, you know what, let me do it. Let me give this a go. And it kind of came at a, a good time in my life as well because I was getting made redundant from my uh, from my job, and so um, I, I still had three months there. I was getting paid. I didn't have a lot of work, and so it was a good time just to start writing. And so. I probably wrote like half the book in that time, the first book. Um, and really kind of the, the, what I was thinking at the time was I would do it. The first book was PS Vita year one, which was um, the the um, origin of that title is really kind of Batman year one. I was kind of those, those comics, oh, which I okay. really loved as well. Sure. Um, and so I thought PS Vita year one, I would do like a book for each year. And so I did the first book, which was, you know, successful. It was, it was awesome to see again, the support. Um, and then when it came to the second book, I kind of realized that actually I can't doing 10 books is probably a bit more than I can really take on. And sure. there probably isn't enough content to make a book for every year. So I made it so that the second book was years two and three, and then the third book was everything onwards. Um, and so, you know, once I got those sort of three books about the Vita out, I started getting, I had requests anyway, during the project, each of them that, you know, to do a hardback book, a collected edition. Um, and so I asked the audience saying, you know, do you guys want that? Because I, I was after the third book, I was thinking, okay, maybe it's done now. Maybe I wouldn't do anything else. But then Sony then announced the whole Vita store closure. There've been so many screw ups with the Vita store over the last few months and all, all the things they've done and, you know, not telling developers about, um, you know, the store closing, uh, you know, I felt like there's the story wasn't over where I left it. And so, um, you know, I asked, I asked my audience, you know, what do you guys prefer? Would you want like kind of a, an extra sort of supplemental book of maybe 40 pages? Or do you want like a hardcover that kind of contains everything? And the, you know, resounding vote was hardcover, do a kind of proper, proper thing, a proper book. And so um, that this will be kind of it. This will be the history of the Vita, 
you know, with those developer uh, developer interviews, with the retrospectives on games, this would be the book, uh, you know, not to be arrogant, but I hope this would be the book about the Vita, essentially. No, there is there is no arrogance there. I mean, you are, as far as I'm concerned, the expert on this machine based on, like you said, this voluminous, almost academic level of coverage. And by the way, not that you asked for my my input on this, but I think your your timing in terms of 2012, then 2013 and 2014, then 2015 and onward, I think that tracks perfectly for the life cycle and how games came out on the handheld. So, you know, well done there. You kind of, you kind of, it's really very nice because I, like you said, that wasn't your intent. And yet I think it actually worked out best for the project. So I wanted to ask you about working with different developers and publishers. Mm-hmm. Um, my in my experience now i've made a f- few games on vita now hmm. so i have a little bit more of a, a a dev seated uh point of view on this but in my point of view when you want to talk about vita with someone that really like their ears perk up and they're interested and they're engaged there are a lot of people in the industry that really liked this machine Mm. And it wasn't just Gio Corsi and Shuhei Yoshida and those guys. It, there are a lot of people in the trenches that really pulled for this thing and, and worked hard and maybe even saved it once or twice um, along the way. So how eager have people been to talk to you about uh, their experiences with Vita? So um, actually, it's been it was really impressive. So for the for the books, I had interviews with people like Shahid Kamal Ahmad, um, the director of Escape Plan, director of Wipeout 2048, of Motorstorm RC, and they they loved talking about it. It was it was really, you know, the interviews were were more about kind of their experiences in the launching, their creating their games, launching their games, and and that early period of the Vita. I really wanted to talk to the guys who were there at the Vita's launch, who were kind of involved in it, and they 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 had I had some great conversations with them. It was really awesome just to kind of hear all these things and all the kind of things they went through and how they inputted into the creation of the Vita, which was amazing as well. Um, you know, I learned so much, uh, so much about it all. So they were, they were really happy to talk about it, which was, which was awesome. I was really pleased with that. And even, I think, I mean, for the, that's, you know, for the book, but even since then, I guess the indie developers who I've spoken to have brought out games for it, even Barry, and you know, for, for mm-hmm. Lenimo, you know, he's been a, a great contact as well. They've been awesome to speak to, and they're always happy to kind of talk about their experiences and, you know, positive and negative when it comes to sure. releasing things on PSN in the, over the years. But um, there have been a lot of great supporters of the Vita, which is especially with indie developers. Yeah, I remember meeting so many devs over the years that <clears throat> had a soft spot for it, whether it was Drinkbox, uh, obviously a very prominent early supporter. Mm-hmm. They had a launch game for it. And I think I've told this story on the podcast at some point in in the past, but I'll tell it here is I have a really fond remembrance of going to Gamescom for the first time. And it was in 2011 and there was like a PlayStation presentation and then it kind of broke away and it was the first time anyone had really gone hands on with Vita. And I remember being attracted to this kiosk with a game that would be escape plan and Deb Mars, Deborah Mars, who was a producer, well renowned producer at Sony. Um, who's working in AAA now, but uh, she is a, a real star of indie at that time. And uh, I remember her showing off the game for the first time and me interacting with the Vita and really falling in love with it. And mm. I was always confounded by the willingness of people to put the work in to put the games out there and the publishers and even the players not really understanding the extent of what was going on on Vita. Do you do you? F- share my frustration with the demise of the machine. And I, I mean that from a deeper philosophical point of view. Obviously, we were yeah. both sad about it, but it was it's a lost opportunity that I think convinced Sony that this wasn't worth it anymore. And I think it was just it's comical to think that people used to say, like, people don't want handhelds anymore. <laughs> yeah, they used yeah. to literally say that. And, and I think Vita was launched into that void. And now we're, and, and we're in the shadow of a of a handheld and switch that is going to sell 100 million units. Um, Easily, so yeah. I'm. I get. I get mad about. I get really well, not mad, but just upset. It's tragic. What do you think? Yeah, I completely agree. I think um, it's funny. I actually just put a video out on my channel, kind of talking about the reasons the Vita failed. I mean, it all comes back to to Sony. I think ultimately, but there's. I think they just they gave up so soon, and you could see the potential in the Vita, 
And, you know, I, I'm not sure if you um, follow kind of the the hacking and the homebrew and the mod community for the Vita, but there is so much that those guys have been able to do just from like people sitting in their bedrooms. And you just think if Sony had just put some more effort and some more money into it, or if, if other companies like Rockstar had believed in the Vita and just tried to launch like Vice City on the Vita instead. Right it could have changed the fortune so much. I think there was so much that they could have done, but it was just like, yeah, you really do feel like everyone just kind of gave up really just way too soon. I think, um, you know, I think the Japanese launch really hurt the Vita generally because it just made it look like this device was not popular. And then I think that probably just hurt it. Everyone, everyone assuming, oh, the Vita's dead. Vita has no games. And those kind of, um, that, that bad reputation just really stuck with it for the whole life. Uh, and yeah, really, I, really hurt it, which is I shame. remember I remember that well. I, every week at IGN, I would write a story about <laughs> media create sales, the Japanese sales charts. Mm-hmm. And thankfully in Japan, these these are public and granular. So it's so fascinating yeah. to see how everything sells. And I remember the sales were soft. I remember also that I think Mario Kart was released yeah. like right there, like Nintendo intentionally kind of yeah. waited to release it until this time, like really hurting the beat. And I agree, it just didn't have a lot of inertia from that that original takeoff. And what I think the biggest shame is, and I'm curious what publishers you think did it best, because there were a couple of publishers that bigger publishers that I felt like hung on for a long time Mm -hmm. and were really pulling their weight. And I want to give a shout out to Bandai Namco. And I want to give a shout out, especially to Square Enix, which I think, I think that for two, for two publishers that had no business releasing games on Vita, but when they were releasing them, they still did. They still were releasing Vita games until last year. I yeah. think Square Enix released their last one. So who who did it right, do you think? Um, we know that Sony did it wrong, I think, even though some great <laughs> games came out like Killzone and others, but yeah. who did it who did it right? I think NIS did a did a good job of supporting yeah, it as well. They had definitely. so many games coming out for the system. Um they yeah, they they I think they, you know, obviously all of them are very Japanese, lots of visual novels, so they may not have appealed to everyone, but they they really stuck with it for for a long time. Um, yeah, like you said, Square Enix they had Romancing Saga three, I think was the last game they put out. Right. Um, and you know, I, I gotta give a shout out to them for for being really awesome in terms of supporting kind of uh, content creators. Well, me really. Um, I remember when I reached out to them, my channel was small, and they said, and you know, a lady there. Um, said, uh, you know, right now your channel's too small. Come back when you're bigger and, you know, we'll talk about if we can start giving you codes and, you know, kind of working with you. Um, I did after about another year and they did. And it was like, I think I was the only person who had a Vita code for Romancing Saga 3 because they especially went out to get it just for me because I was That's asking awesome. for it. Yeah, they were really, really good. I got to, you know, got to give, give props to them. Um, I Atlas, the least we had uh, Persona 4 Golden, they did bring the dancing games in uh, in Japan, yep. uh, Persona 5 and 3 Dancing. It was, would have liked to have it here, and Catherine as well. It should have come over here for Vita, but you know they did support it in Japan at least. But yeah, um, yeah I think Square Enix, NIS, Atlas, Namco Bandai, I think those are kind of the, probably the big ones that yeah, really I, uh, did a lot. I'm, I'm sorry to interrupt you. I was going to say, I, I Am Setsuna was one of those games yeah, that I feel yeah. like was missing. <laughs> but I think otherwise they did a really nice job. I, I think you'll find this anecdote funny when final fantasy 10 was coming out on mm-hmm. vita and ps3 um i was trying to get square enix at that time to uh give me a copy of the game and usually and i'm sure you've seen this at this point they would give games on cards mm-hmm. that were just blank cards with white text like white blocks on them with black text they look very specific i have a ton of them uh, in yeah. my in my like boxes and they would just burn these roms and send them off but Square Enix didn't understand how to do that. And they would send, they sent like these builds that you needed to use like a dev kit PS oh, Vita sure. with. And and so I, so I had to go back to them and be like, guys, you don't even, you're, you don't even understand that we can't, literally can't play the games you're giving us. In other words, like publishers weren't even instructed in a proper way to interact with people with PR and marketing and codes. They had no idea, some of these big companies, how it worked. They thought that you, they could just send you a package or a disc a yeah. burned disc like they could for ps3 and it would work so i always think about that too is like did were they doing the appropriate amount of heft you know and, and lift on their end to um yeah. to make that happen which is disappointing you know because i remember dealing with people like at nis that were experts at the the vita but yeah. then you would talk to people 
at Bandai Namco, maybe, and I really like those guys, but that knew it a little bit less. Um, yeah. What did you think as a coverage person? What do you think about having no way? I mean, you have it with PSTV, but no way of capturing direct feed. I'm curious how you have worked around that and, and how tragic that is as well. Because I'll tell you, and I'm sure you know this too, companies would visit you with HDMI enabled Vitas. They had them working. Yeah. They, were, they worked totally fine. Sony would come and bring it. You were never allowed to take a picture of it because they didn't want to admit it. Um, yeah, yeah. But that's how we captured direct feed of all of these games. Um, how have you counteracted that? Has PSTV been a good tool for you in that regard? It was for a long time. I think um, for, for probably for, um, up till about two or three years ago, um, I was doing PSTV and just kind of, you know, talking to a microphone on the side while I was playing the game on the PSTV. Um, but actually, so again, I'm not sure you're aware, but the homebrew community have found a way to um, stream out directly from your Vita. So you use the USB, the you know normal kind of the USB micro, and plug it into a, a monitor, a, you know, a computer, a PSPC, and you can actually stream out to it and record directly on OBS. That's awesome. Um, which is so cool. That's just made you know things so much easier because oh the PSTV is is it it's got a lot of good features about it, but you know when you got a game like Little Big Planet or Tear Away that need touchscreen, right. you can't do it with that. So um, I, that's been a big help. And again, uh, you know, like you said, it's like Sony had that capability. Clearly, the Vita is capable of doing that because homebrew developers have found a way to do it. If Sony had just unlocked that potential the Vita could have been like the Switch. You know, you could have had like a little dock for it. It could have gone out to your TV. You wouldn't need a PSTV at all. You could have just had the Vita. Uh, it just, again, another missed opportunity from Sony. Yeah, it's a, it's a, it was so stubborn. I, we used to tell yeah. them that. They knew, I guess, like some of the PR people I worked with, but they were, I think, afraid of what people could do uh, with like yeah. these enhanced Vitas, I guess. And I think they were also afraid, frankly, of what games looked like hdmi out people would be like this game looks like shit and and they'd be like that's not a na it's native resol resolution and i don't think they wanted to explain that stuff but i think that yeah i think they had a the potential of having a switch before the switch came out but alas we can we can opine that all day yeah. um we talk about some of these publishers and companies um sony obviously in their missteps what are some of the games that stick out to you on this machine what, what are your some of your favorite titles um so i think um we we talked about this over email before about ease eight um i'm a big fan of that game i still kind of stand by it i've tried to go back and platinum it but um i think the grind is just too much for me <laughs> so it comes yeah. to, like, getting okay. materials and stuff i think it just kind of gave up but i'm a bit i you know i really love the kind of the 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 graphics the scope the gameplay the story i'm, I'm a big fan of that game um I think from an indie front, it's got so many awesome games, you know, Darkest Dungeon, um, Salt and Sanctuary, the Steamworld games, so many, so many great games there. It's, it's, I think before the Switch, it really was kind of like the place to go for indie games, you know, at least for, you know, when it comes to portable. Right. Um, but then even like first party games, you know, I love Freedom Wars, Wipeout 2048, Killzone Mercenary. Um, yeah, I've, I've been a big fan of all these games. And I, this was the system where I, I wasn't into um uh, uh visual novels at all before um but you know playing this danganronpa one and two were just amazing you know so good and you know i think i never would have even touched those games if it weren't for them being on the vita um and you know kind of discovering it through people like you actually i remember you talking about it years before a couple of years before i played it because i played it quite late um but you know i, I remember it, like it getting hype and then trying it and it's like this is awesome and it just never would have i never would have played it if i was just on my ps4 or something that's that's the beauty of the machine was the mm. the not only the mobile offerings but just the more thoughtful offerings like a, a game like Danganronpa feels like it should be read almost like held yeah, in your hand exactly I know some people play it on PS3 and PS4 but um I, to me I'm like at ah, you know I don't want I don't want to give it too much credit in the, in the sense that uh, Ace Attorney was probably my introduction to those types of games but mm. again a handheld. Uh, giving me like you said uh, an experience that i would have never had uh, or never would have given a chance on yeah. uh console i got to give a shout out to your fellow brits though over there uh future lab i thought they were great oh, yeah. too with velocity ultra and velocity 2x those are fantastic awesome games, games. Yeah. and 
I love that you gave a shout out to Killzone because I last year, last spring, I went back and played it again on hard. I just just knocked okay. that gold trophy out. And I was like, this is awesome. I I I, I always knew I reviewed it at IGN. Like I always mm-hmm. knew that it was great, but going back, I was astounded about how well it held up, especially in the light of the fact that we really got a pretty bad resistance game. We got a pretty bad <laughs> Call of Duty game. Do you think that there was anything specifically missing that would have benefited Vita? Do you think that my thesis that maybe more reliance on FPS and high quality FPS and maybe even FPS that you could play over Wi-Fi and really play that up would have been a benefit to the machine? I, I think so. I think a proper Call of Duty game that really that isn't a 30% on Metacritic <laughs> would have would have been a big help. Yeah, and um, wasn't made even, in four months or whatever. Yeah, it was. exactly. I, I mean, you know, in fairness to it, it, the multiplayer is still pretty fun. Um, but it's it's it, the Vita could have done so much more if they had just put the more kind of time and money into it, or even just ported Call of Duty Zombies, which was on Android already. If they had ported, ported that, I think that would have helped. Um, I, I think also it's it, probably Grand Theft Auto games. I think yeah. those would have done a huge amount for the Vita. Um, you know, EA were doing their legacy FIFA versions, so. You know, I, I think that, you know, they gave up really, really quickly on the Vita. Um, I think when I think of other games, you know, we had Assassin's Creed, but again, that didn't do overly well in terms of uh, Metacritic score. We had Need for Speed. There were so many kind of big, big companies, big games that actually supported the Vita in that first year. But then I think it just dropped off so quickly after that. Um, but I think a proper Call of Duty and a proper Grand Theft Auto game, that would have that would have really helped uh, turn around the fortunes. I agree. It's so interesting because we can't uh, you talk about PSP earlier. We can't overstate mm. how much Grand Theft Auto, Liberty City Stories and Vice City Stories helped that machine. Yeah. And they mitigated the risk by porting them to the PS2. They were probably actually built on PS2 and ported the other way and that behind the scenes, although they mm. came out in reverse. But I agree with you. They they could have done more, I think. Unfortunately, I think Rockstar would have probably had the propensity to help, but I think Chinatown Wars and the experience with that oh, yeah. scared them off for some reason because that game just didn't do very well. Although I think that that was their mistake aiming that originally at a, a Nintendo audience, which was DS, a strange yeah. move. Yeah. But um, I'm curious with uh, you talking earlier about gaming history and, and some of the things you like to read. I'm a, I'm a fan of reading about video game history too i'm curious what some of your favorite works are like is there a book or two that you point at that you think is like the a book that everyone must read for instance i often point people to masters of doom as one of those books that um everyone must read which is a a book about the creation of id i think that that's one of the great gaming Mm -hmm. history books um is there anything that stands out for you as a student there was there is um i've completely blanked on the title though it's it's the book that kind of goes into the history of Nintendo, um, the early days, kind of from the NES. Oh, game over. Game over. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Yeah. That's yeah. brilliant. That was That's that. A, was, yeah. Actually, I think that was one of the first kind of gaming sort of history books I read, and I really just thought this is so interesting. You know, really, really interesting. And I remember so um, in uh, whenever I'm driving the kids to school, I always kind of like um, telling them stories. Normally, kind of like either comic book or movie stories that I'm kind of just like adapting to, to make it uh you know okay for them to hear and i remember just telling them kind of the history of like nintendo and sony and everything they were riveted by it you know they loved to hear stuff like that and it, and it was that book i think that really kind of got me into into this aspect to make me realize that you know it's not just a game you play on the tv for eight hours there's so much more going on with the history of these companies and so much more fascinating things that have happened and these risks that people have taken it's just so interesting to read about I totally agree. I I looked it up because I wanted to make sure I got the name right because it's it's game over and it's by David Sheff, who's a pretty well known yeah. journalist. He had a few big books afterwards. Um, but shout out to my buddy that I used to work with at IGN, Andy Eddy, who's a great student of the industry as well, mm-hmm. who wrote the update to Game oh, Over. Okay, and uh, I think like everything after SNES, and they re released it. So that's a a really wonderful pull. That's like one of the that to me mm-hmm. is the very first book about gaming that is seminal yeah. uh highly recommended awesome pull i always always recommend fire in the valley as well which is a book about the history of silicon valley uh, intel and all of those companies if you want a broader okay, yeah i haven't read that one. Okay. yeah that's that's a good one too 
the movie um, Pirates of Silicon Valley, which was an awesome movie, was based on uh, that book. Um, Ooh, okay. And I, I'm glad that you gave a shout out to Jeremy Parrish, um, who I had the pleasure of working with and knowing personally um, when he was at IGN. Well, he was at One Up, and we bought mm-hmm. One Up. He's a real great student of the industry. He does retro knots and all of that stuff. Mm. Who, who else in this space are you attracted to as far as their content is concerned that might support Vita or other um, or any other games that you might be interested in? Who's kind of doing it right? Yeah, there aren't many people supporting the Vita, actually. To be honest, no, I, I know. I mean, that's why I'm kind yeah. of I'm kind of inquisitively asking. Like, I know about like the old i don't mean to be i'm not trying to be rude or but the old woman the older woman that does oh like, yeah, Britta. Of, yeah yeah food right. for dogs. yeah right yeah, yeah. right i know her and that's it yeah. like so yeah. is there anyone i'm, I'm missing <laughs> um and you there is another there's a couple other uh, smaller channels there's also a great um a great website so this is kind of a shout out to actually to to the guy who edits who's been editing my books from the beginning uh adam cartwright who's um i'm gonna get the name wrong so but, but um it's it's uh he, on twitter you know what let me just check because i know i'm gonna get it wrong sure um, but it's kreshnik uh he didn't put his real name on on twitter it's, it's it's okay twitter's just not working okay leave it um but <laughs> but um he my uh, editor it's i'll put it on my website or put it on the link or something but he's a he's a great writer really good writer and again he's uh, an awesome resource when it comes to Vita history, uh, reviews of games. And, you know, I love the way his uh, his writing style as well, which is why I approached him and said, hey, look, you know, would you edit the books? Because I think, um, you know, I think I really respect his uh, his writing style and his opinion as well. That's awesome. And are you did you write everything yourself or is there is there a collaboration with other writers? Um, so like a- s- some of the retrospectives um, were written by others. Um, probably about maybe eight or nine of them uh, across the across the three books, um, but all the history is uh, was done by me, and, and most of the retrospectives are done by me. That's awesome. So this is like this is so cool because I now I only have my BA in history, but I went to school for American history, and I, that's like my great passion and love outside of gaming. And you have created a primary sourced document <laughs> that will be cited and can and will be cited for years to come. There might never be a history of Vita deeper than this, because how could there be if you if you've gone hands on with all these games, if you've talked to all the developers, those are the primary sources, maybe we can crack the Sony nut a little bit more. You know, I have a lot of interesting conversations behind the scenes about Vita with people that have worked on it and and know about it. And I can tell you some of these things offline, for sure. Mm -hmm. But um, it's, uh, it's so it's so nice. And and it, it kind of like gives me energy that I need sometimes a uh, creative energy to see someone putting themselves into something like this. And that's what I want to talk about now is the book itself. Vita means life. Hmm. Again, you guys can go check it out on Kickstarter. What, first of all, I want to start at the top. Like how excited are you right now that, that, the, that it's doing so well? Is this something that has blown you away? I mean, obviously I like to think people lowball a little bit on Kickstarter to be realistic, but hmm. this yeah. is, this is much more than you asked for five times more four and a half times more so so far so how are you feeling about that and like what's the reaction been in your family and and elsewhere um yeah amazing it's it's um i kind of i'm i'm a a bit strange in terms of sometimes i'm very sort of positive sometimes i'm quite glass half uh, half empty Um, and so sometimes i just look at the number and think oh my god this is just unbelievable you know i can't believe this many people want it and this many people want to support me um, especially because, you know, I, I, I've always been, well, throughout the Kickstarter, I've been worried about the cost because it is expensive producing a hardback book and I'm not producing tens of thousands, you know, it's probably, it'll be in the hundreds. Right. And so it's expensive to produce something like that. And it's just amazing that, you know, everyone wants to, wants to support me. And then part of me kind of worries that, um, you know, is it going to be good enough? Are people going to be happy with it? And then, then there's also, also the logistics worry of it because, um, I think, okay, if I get 550 of these books in my house, how the hell am I going to manage packing and posting them and, and doing all of that as well? And, you know, my wife kind of uh, getting very frustrated at me at times with previous books, but um, it's, it's amazing. It is amazing. And I just, uh, I just kind of uh, need to sort of calm down sort of the other thoughts in my head about sort of, uh, is it going to be good enough or, you know, how am I going to manage all the logistics? Um, I'm quite, um, my wife accuses me of being a bit too humble. So when I did the first book, I didn't tell anyone in my family. I only told my wife when I was 
you know, nearly done with it. I, I don't know why. I just kind of, even the YouTube channel, I didn't tell anyone for a long time just because I thought, and, you know, no one's going to really be interested in terms of, because no one, no one in my family, none of my friends play video games. So this right. is just kind of a me thing. Um, and so I just thought, ah, no one's really going to care. There's no point telling anyone. And so once I told my wife and then she saw the success, then she obviously went and told everyone. And so even for this book, you know, she's told, you know, she told my mom, my dad, everybody. And so it's been, it's actually been very cool because for previous times, they only found out after the books were done that right. I had done something. And now they're kind of seeing it during the project. Uh, and, you know, they're all being really kind of supportive and proud. And it's kind of like, oh, this is, this is cool. You know, it's, uh, it's, it's nice to kind of see that support as well. Um, first of all, yeah. And first of all, again, congratulations. It's cool to be the Thank toast you. of like your family or your social group for a little while. Um, I was going to ask you about the process a little bit and about the logistics. First of mm. all, again, you're not asking for my advice. I think you, I think you hire someone to do all of the shipping and handling for you. That's my opinion. Uh, so now that's, I, that's an option, but I mean, you might want to keep more, you might want to keep the money for yourself. This is about margins, you know, but, but what, what do you think about that idea? So it's, it's, it wasn't actually the margins I was worried about. It's more the cost to everyone else, mm. because if I do that, then suddenly, you know, the shipping goes up by, you know, 20, 30%. And oh, I just, I just feel even for the first book, um, you know, I was, uh, I only, I put that one up for four pounds and for this one as well. I, I kind of, I price it. I'm not trying to like kind of make a huge profit on this. And I never, I, that was never my intention. Um, and I, I, I know I will make a decent profit now, but it's there's nothing wrong with more. making a profit by yeah, the way. I, know, I, I do I appreciate know. your intent, but good for yeah. you. Yeah. <laughs> I know, I, but I just kind of feel bad about just kind of then charging people more for for trying to get this third party company because they cost they cost a lot for right. for what they do, and it just then it's kind of like man, am I just? It, it, sometimes I look at it and think, would I pay that much for something like this, or you know, would I kind of like uh, hesitate? And so I just I just feel bad like trying to charge people more for something like that. I appreciate that. I mean, we try to do the same thing on Patreon with you know our lowest tier is a dollar um hmm. the but the most people are actually attracted to the five dollar tier we have that th that's where the most people are but we want to give people an option on the lower end if they want to support us in some way hmm. so that's cool um so what about you hadn't noted that you found an editor smart yeah um like how did you I i'm kind of curious for this myself like how this is kind of like what would be called a vanity publish, right? Like a, a small, mm. a small, like non book deal publishing. So, and I hate that term because it makes it seem like people are, you know, vain, but yeah. that is the term. I don't know why that's the term, but how do you go about finding the right partners to kind of dance with, with this? Uh, are you, are you looking at price? Are you looking at quality? Are you looking at people, you know, I mean, I wouldn't even know where to begin. And I'm wondering how you kind of tackled that, that problem, especially for a hardcover book. Yeah, it's, um, I think for the, in terms of publishing the book itself, I've had one um, publisher who, who I've used for the last few years who've been really good in terms of reasonable price and really good quality. So um, that, that kind of just worked out, actually, that they, they happen to be the cheapest, but actually they've been really good in quality as well. Um, so I've been really, really kind of lucky and happy with, uh, with those guys. So um, that's, that's been great. I think in terms of the editor, that was something I knew pretty early on. I need to have somebody because it's, you can't do something like this on your own. You could write something and it could just seem okay to you. But actually when, when Adam reviews it and he comes up with like all these like little tweaks and it's like, oh yeah, okay. That's, I'm, I'm glad I've got you, you know, cause it really does definitely. help. Um, oh, definitely. It was actually when I launched the first book, um, I, I was doing the design myself. Um, and you can see, I think you can go and see the, the first Kickstarter because the pictures are still there of kind of what I, what I put together. And I was reached out to by a guy called Steve, Steve Thon. Um, and he's a designer and he said to me, Hey, you know, I'm a fan of the Vita, uh, and I'm a professional designer. And he said it nicely, but he said that, you know, your book looks shit. And so, you know, you need to, um, you need a proper designer. I'm happy to, happy to work with you. And so um, since then, I've been working with Steve and he's been awesome. He's been, and it just kind of fell, fell into that kind of relationship, awesome. but he's been great and he's designing this book as well. And uh, he's been an awesome support as well throughout this, uh, this whole process. And just really lucky that kind of uh, stumbled uh, or that he kind of uh, reached out to me. Really glad he did. That's kind of the way it works. That's how I found <laughs> my executive producer, Dustin. He just reached mm. out to me at the right place, right time, right guy, right message. I mean, that's, that's yeah. everything. Um, 
And I also feel like being an entrepreneur means learning what you don't know. And I think it's hmm. smart to say like, oh, I'm not a designer. I'm a writer. I'm not, you know, now I, but I got to say, I give you a lot of credit because, you know, I, I'm friends with Pat Contry who, who writes these, it puts out these great books about Nintendo, NES, SNES and N64. And I'm, I, I know him personally, but my brother Dagan, hmm. who also does podcasts with us, wrote a bunch of reviews in those books and they really had to split everything up so granularly to get any of that work done. I really give you a, a lot of credit tethering to this, my question earlier, just about getting all of this done yourself. And I always remember asking devs this, especially when I would do preview coverage uh, at IGN and, and they hate it. But I'm going to ask you this question as we begin to wrap up. Um, what what do you want to do next? Like, is there like it seems like you have incredible creative energy. So I wonder, is there like something else you're identifying as wanting to put this energy into or are you still thinking about it? So. Um... It was, I actually started, I think it was after the first book or, or kind of around that time, I started writing thinking that I would do a book about the PSP. Um, and funnily enough, now that kind of this Kickstarter is out, I've actually had people message me saying, oh, you know, would you do the PSP next? So um, I might go back and revisit that because, you know, it's, I didn't choose the Vita just because I, you know, uh, it, it, I chose it because I love that the device. And I feel the same way about the PSP. It's just been one of these devices that I just so awesome as I was talking about at the beginning. Um, and so I think that could be a cool kind of next step. Um, I mean, you know, you're right though about the amount of work because, you know, each of those books was a huge amount of work and, you know, uh, my wife was definitely, uh, complaining at times, the amount of time it was taking up, but I'm kind of one of these people that if I'm not working or doing something like that, then I'm just a bit bored and I kind of do nothing. I just end up procrastinating doing nothing. And so it's kind of good to have something that I focus on and, uh, I, I, you know, there are times when, you know, I'll be sitting there in front of the laptop and, you know, write maybe like a hundred words or something. Uh, and then there'll be times when I just kind of like just knock out of, you know, 2000 words and it's like, oh, it turns out to be really good. I mean, I remember actually just um, when, I, when I was writing the Sound Shapes retrospective for the book, it wasn't, it wasn't working. You know, I was just like writing and just, it wasn't coming out right. Um, I sat down and I played the game. Uh, I remember it was like a Friday night. I started playing it, finished the game pretty much, I think in about three or four hours or something. And then I just started writing at 2 a.m. And just like within half an hour, I was done. And it was like, yes, you know, it's like, I think it's that kind of focus where that that's where I work best. And so, um, yeah, I kind of like, I would like to maybe kind of tackle PSP probably next, you know, give myself something else to, to kind of focus on and work on. That would be awesome. And uh, I'll definitely keep an eye out for that one. Of course, this audience will keep an eye out for that as well. Now, do you collect... Or do you, do you collect Vita games at all, like physical games? Yes, yeah, I've got way, way too many. <laughs> do you have Do you have any of my games? Uh, yeah, I've got Twin Breaker, Hybroxia One and Two. Yeah. Oh, okay. I was gonna say I was gonna. So that's one thing I can't do for you. I was gonna be like, I'll, <laughs> I'm, I'll very happily send you those if you don't have them. But I'm glad you do. Thank you for your support. No, no um, problem. And the other thing I wanted to say was because my audience knows that, like I, back in the day, I really came out against kickstarter like 10 years ago hmm. and I've, I've kind of watched it come into its own and yeah. like i i always felt like in the beginning and i don't know if you agree but when you think about 2010 2011 2012 people were like i almost felt like we're getting taken for a ride and a lot of stuff was announced mm -hmm. and never came out but then shovel knight was the game some 10 years ago that yeah. really attracted me and made me realize that making these declarative statements is a mistake and so i want you to know and i, I haven't done it yet because I, wa I wanted to tell you i'm going to do it tonight is that your vita means life book will be the first kickstarter i ever support um and i'm gonna i'm gonna back it this evening and i want if the audience is interested to go check it out themselves vita means life on kickstarter um is there any closing comment you want to say before we go I mean, that's, I'm, I'm touched, Colin. I mean, you look, man, I would just send you a copy. I think I even said I'd happily well, send you a copy. I appreciate that, but I don't, I don't want, that's fine. I, I'm very happy to buy, buy one. So um, oh, thank you. Thanks yeah, a lot. I, yeah, I, I think it's time to jump over that hurdle for myself, <laughs> erase that mental barrier and, and have a more open mind to this stuff. And I think this is the perfect project for that. So yeah, very happy to do it. Awesome. No, thank you very much. And like, I, you know, I guess it's, it's a huge thank you to, to all the people who backed uh, back the project. It is is really amazing. And, you know, I'm working hard. I want to make sure I deliver something that people can be proud of. And, you know, people can be proud to have on their shelves and really kind of do the Vita justice. And, you know, I don't, I, I don't hold back in the book. It's not, this isn't just gushing about Sony or anything. I'm trying to be very fierce over this is kind of objective. It's an objective book, not kind of my views. 
um, about the events that happened and everything that shaped the Vita's life. Um, and so I just, yeah, I hope I can do it all justice and, you know, really appreciate the support. And, and you know, Colin, thank you for, for inviting me onto, onto your show. That's really, really, really appreciate it. It's awesome to, awesome to talk to you. Yeah, it's, it's great to talk to you too. And, and nice to meet you finally in person, mm. like, you know, in person is digital. Yeah, yeah. Um, we're going to get to the UK, I think in 2022. So we'll, oh, we'll cool. if we do a show, we'll definitely invite you out, but, definitely. um, but certainly we want to wish you the very best on this project. The audience comes in, um, with Vita love all the time. I think this for a segment of our audience is going to be perfect. So I wanted to make them aware again, Vita means life on Kickstarter. Um, Sandeep Rai, it's good to talk to you, my friend. I hope, you know, let's do it again in early 2022. I'll open a mailbag up on Patreon and people can okay. ask more granular and nerdy Vita questions that only you and I would care about anyway. I wouldn't even bore Chris and Dustin yeah. with this shit. Dustin might sit there and pretend he cares, but he doesn't. So, uh, I appreciate your time and I thank you all out there for your love, kindness and support of Sacred Symbols and Sacred Symbols Plus. We'll see you next time. Goodbye. Thanks, Colin. Sacred Symbols, a PlayStation podcast, is a product and trademark of Last Stand Media and Collins Last Stand LLC and is proudly recorded in the USA. The show is conceived by, is written by, and is directed by me, Colin Moriarty. My co-hosts are Chris Raygun Maldonado and Dustin Furman. The show is produced by executive producer Dustin Furman. It's edited by associate producer Ben Smith. All of Last Stand's theme music is by my best friend, Ramon Narvaez. As you know, all of Last Stand's shows, including Sacred Symbols, are fan-funded on Patreon at patreon.com slash laststandmedia. The following names are at the producer level on Patreon, our highest tier, and we're grateful for your thoughtful and kind contributions to our independent endeavor. Thank you.